This is Vanessa Marshall, Harrison Dula from Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. You know, in 1983, this little movie came out. You may have heard of it. It was called Return of the Jedi. This was the film where we were promised to see Luke Skywalker as a fully-fledged Jedi Knight. We were finally going to see what happened to Han Solo. Was he going to get released from the Carbonite? What was going to happen to him? And who are those little teddy bears on the poster? Well, we're going to talk all about that. And the amazing book, Star Wars Return of the Jedi, a visual archive. I have got two of the authors of this wonderful book here with me. Um, first, uh, returning guest and, and my great pal, the Chewbacca to my Han, because you are taller than me, Clayton Sandell. Clayton, welcome back, buddy. Hello, everybody. How are you? It's going well. And, and Solo will always be special because that's where you and I first met. And you took that a picture of me by George Lucas and we didn't even know each other yet. That's true. I, I took a picture of George Lucas as he was walking down the red carpet. And lo and behold, there in the background, uh, photo bombing my shot was the great Dan Zare. <laughs> <laughs> How about that? How about that? Well, it's, it's great to see you, buddy. Looking forward to talking about this and uh, celebrating your work. But also joining us, this is her first time on Coffee with Kenobi, the author is S.T. Benday. I said it correctly. Woohoo! And S.T., it is so great to have you on the show. It sounds like we've got a lot of mutual friends, too. We do. I'm so excited to see you. I've just heard the loveliest things, so it's nice to get to chat and catch up on some fun Star Wars things. Absolutely. Well, this I couldn't imagine. Uh, Kelly, Kelly Knox is the other author. Kelly uh, was on recently to talk about Star Wars dad jokes, but Kelly could not join us tonight. But I think it's going to work out just fine because these two have written such a, a beautiful book. Uh, honestly, so there have been so many retrospectives and books about Return of the Jedi. I know what I think, uh, but I want to see what the two of you think about what makes this one unique. But before we get to that, I just want to hear your just overall thoughts to Return of the Jedi. Clayton, do you remember when you first saw this movie and the kind of the reaction you had, the hype and all of that? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I I was ten, I guess, when it came out. So I was I was so excited. My aunt Dana had taken me uh, to stand in line for like four hours to see The Empire Strikes Back a few years earlier. So we were like fully into uh, the the hype and the anticipation for this movie. Um, but I will say, it was the movie that. Uh, an experience around that movie is what made me so anti-spoiler these days. Like I'm very careful with what I talk about these days, primarily because with Return of the Jedi, I was on the playground at my elementary school and my best friend, Chris Martinez, ran up to me on the playground and he said, Luke and Leia are brother and sister. And I went, <laughs> oh, OK. Eh, you know, it would have been nice to hear that in the theater uh but um so so that's that's like the the memory i i most closely associate with that movie is that my my best friend ruined the biggest plot twist of the whole movie uh but i i, I love the movie and it's um it's one that um it, it's a it's a toss-up so if i'm if i'm just wanting to put something on and just have it on and just kick back and maybe i'm doing something around the house but it'll either be empire or or a close second Jedi. And lately it's been Jedi just because of working on the project and the anniversary and all of that. So, yeah. So it's like your star Wars comfort food. Totally star Wars comfort food. A hundred percent. Yep. Uh, ST, what about you? What are you, what are your uh, memories of return of the Jedi? And do you remember when you first saw the film? I do. So I'm, I'm a convert. I did not see the films until I was an adult and I saw them all in one weekend. So it was a whole wow. lot of Star Wars. It was six, uh, six at the time. And so I saw them all. Um, Empire is my favorite, uh, but four and six are tied for second for me. Um, I loved the speeder bike chase. I love the Ewoks. I loved um, all of the artistry of the film, but I think I grew to appreciate this story more just through seeing different events at celebration or at screenings over the years. Um, I was at a at an, at an event um, where Dennis Murin was walking everyone through how they did the speeder bike chase, and he was showing all the little. Okay, and here was this doll on this, and this is how we did this, and like it was, it just was so fascinating how something 
so seamless, was so technical on so many levels until it could get there. And it was just really amazing and inspirational for me. So um, I'm a big fan. I love that. I love that. Well, yeah. I'm a big fan of this book. This book, yeah. dare I say it's interactive. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's just, uh, you know, I, I, you know, like I said, I remember getting the, the, the Star Wars the Return of the Jedi storybook. Right. And yeah. I remember seeing how cool that was and just seeing these images. Uh, and there's a lot of images out there, Return of the Jedi. But this one has images that not only call back to the classic film, but also show how elements of this film have carried over to modern Star Wars, the Mandalorian and mm-hmm. other things. T- kind of talk about the construction of the book and what makes it different from other uh, reference books. And Clayton, why don't we start with you? Sure. So uh, it's you're right. There's there've been a lot of, written about uh, Return of the Jedi, and I think that if you want the gold standard of the the behind the 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 scenes of Return of the Jedi, you got to go back to J.W. Rinsler and Absolutely. That, book that he wrote, and nobody could ever nobody could ever top that. And that's not what we were trying to do. This is sort of an interesting hybrid that's that's basically organized chronologically, so beginning of the movie to the end, and kind of goes through not only behind the scenes stuff, and there's some great behind the scenes anecdotes that have been drawn from many, many, many uh, different sources uh, throughout the years, but, um, but also a discussion of, of the story and the costumes and the concept art and all of these things. And so it's sort of this hybrid uh, thing that, that is behind the scenes, that is story, but it's also, uh, where I think it's a lot different from other projects is those connections that you talked about. So I think that Return of the Jedi, more than any of the other original trilogy films, has this this sort of enduring legacy of being such a huge source of designs and ideas and just things that carried forward through uh, th- through Star Wars projects today, whether it's, you know, speeder bikes or scout troopers or my favorite, the folding wing shuttle, you know, it's it's all of these things that, that originated with Jedi and that creators are still coming back to, you know, 40 years later. When you watch that scene from uh, The Mandalorian where, you, you know, the, the scout troopers are sitting there on their speeder bikes punching little Grogu. It, I mean, that's there's a direct lineage there yeah. all the way back to Jedi. And there are so many examples uh, like that through throughout modern Star Wars stories that I think, I think Return of the Jedi sort of occupies this special place of being um, like I said, this source, you know, empire gave us walkers, you know, things that walked on four legs and probe droids and things like that. There's things that every movie contributed, but I think if you added them up, I think that Jedi sort of is, is more things came from Jedi than, uh, than, than I think any of the, the other original films. And so it's sort of a celebration of all that stuff that has carried on all these years. Well, and I, so I, we, as authors, we're huge fans too. So for us, we got to all, every moment you sat there and went, Oh my gosh, that the Grogu seat, that's those, those speeders. I remember where they came from. Like we got to put that in there. And if we all love rebels, which some of us really love rebels, we got to do our rebel shout outs because obviously there were moments in, you know, that series that drew from this or bad batch or whatever it is that we were individually into. We kind of got to pour a little bit of that into the book too and make it a, an all connecting Star Wars love story. Oh, I like an all connecting Star Wars love story. That's good. Is that going so glad, back? Yeah, and, and and I'm so glad you brought up the Bad Batch because uh, we we have you know in in Jedi there were two uh, there were supposed to be two Death Stars right, and then Larry Kasdan decided it was making the story too complicated, and so they they cut one of them out. But Ralph McQuarrie nonetheless did some artwork. And what was so cool is that, and this was after this book had been published, so we didn't we didn't put it in, obviously. But this pops up, uh, this almost exact scene pops up mm-hmm. in one of the the recent episodes of the Bad Batch, and I was like that, I was like that meme, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio like pointing at the <laughs> TV when I pop, pop up, like, watching the Bad Batch, and they're like those those Death Star designs popped up, and it was like that's a Jedi thing. There's well, another example. So anyway, it's yeah, one of those things that kind of carries on. Well, that's one of the great things that uh, 
that the story group incorporates into all of these stories is there are there are no wasted there's no wasted material right there there's so much that dave filoni and, and everyone else uses that they throw in the rebels and the bad batch and the mandalorian whether it's names or planets or images or are taking from Ralph McQuarrie's exquisite concept art and just making come to life in other ways. So besides what you just mentioned, which is a great catch on Bad Batch, what I didn't even think about, what are some other things that you both learned about Star Wars overall because of writing this book? Vanessa, let's start with you on that. Ooh. <laughs> well, um, gosh, maybe that enhanced kind of your love of Star Wars. Yeah, I always fall a little bit more in love with a film when I get to work on a project that ties into it, um, because research really is my favorite part. Um, and I do a lot of fiction, but nonfiction is really fun because you get to go super deep with that research. And this project was really neat um, because we had an amazing editor that put everything into this massive drive for us. Like every research material we could possibly need was just in a huge drive. So we were able to read through a lot of books and a lot of um, old Star Wars insider magazines and pull all of these things out. So I'm having a really hard time narrowing it down to something specific, but I do remember really being tickled to find out how playful the set seemed to be. Um, I got to write about Endor and the Ewok actors liked to play a lot of practical jokes on the rest of the crew. So um, they would ambush them with water balloons when they were trying to eat their lunch or um, there was somebody, it wasn't his official title, but he was known as the Ewok Wrangler. And so he, he would have to get them all where they needed to be at a certain time. And they played a prank one day where they said, we're just gonna, we're just gonna tell him we're not coming. And then he'll freak out and have to come and find us. And then of course they hid in the woods and scared him when they, um, he came to go and look for them. So just the kind of the playfulness that made it really fun on set, like seeing that come through in the film and all of the joy that we feel when we watch, I feel like now I see that joy they were having and that's part of what has given me so much enjoyment in watching it. And that's fun because they, because the, the Ewoks were all ages, right? They weren't all little kids, yeah, right? They were all right. Like, that makes it that makes it extra fun too, Clayton. I'm I'm sure there were certain things um, that you noticed. In fact, you and I may have talked about this before. Uh, but what are some things that really kind of helped enhance Star Wars for you through the creation of this book? You know, I think it's 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 going through and kind of like you were saying earlier, just this idea that you know an idea that that gets shelved or put in a drawer somewhere is not is, is nothing it's never really gone and and the respect that that they had for a lot of these things that were done uh, you know will 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 at some point see the light of day and there was um uh, you know I, I had i had read rinsler's book but i think diving into um diving into more of the behind the scenes this time around i was i became much more aware of things like uh the designs for a planet that ultimately got cut from the script was this, you know, citywide planet that, that had city all, all over it. And it, it ended up getting, getting chopped from the script. And, um, and then, you know, it is basically the model for a Coruscant in the Phantom Menace and, you know, Doug Chang says, I, I didn't re even do that much work on Coruscant because Ralph Macquarie had already done all of this great work to design, to design Coruscant. So it's just neat seeing how, um, how, how those designs get reused, but also there was something that, that I hadn't really studied closely, which was this uh, sort of story uh, conference that they had when they were talking about Return of the Jedi when they were making it and trying to hash out the, the script. And what's really interesting is that in this story conference, George Lucas basically maps out the entire story arc of the prequels in 1982 or whenever this story conference was happening. And, you know, he talks about, he talks about Anakin and his relationship with this powerful politician who sort of steers him to the dark side. And he talks about uh, his relationship with his wife and, and the twins, their, their twin children. And he even maps out 
the, the he says there's this this final confrontation with uh, between Anakin and Obi Wan Kenobi at an active volcano. So it's like, you know, it, this was all it, you, you. It gave me a a whole new appreciation for the prequels by seeing how George had laid out this entire story back when they were making Jedi all those years earlier. So it was it was kind of neat to kind of really get in the weeds and and dive into stuff like that that I didn't really I didn't have a really have a great understanding of. So that was a lot of fun, very enlightening. Isn't it wonderful knowing that that I mean we all obviously we we very much respect and think so incredibly highly of George Lucas, but just knowing that this incredible mind was percolating. Can we say percolating on coffee with Kenobi? Yeah. Um, there you go. About how that all uh, was coming together in, in forming um, this wonderful, rich galaxy that we love so much. So a- as a writer uh, and a teacher of writing myself, I really like hearing about the process of how these books come together. Because this one, this is, there's a lot of text in this. There's, there's a lot to go through. There's, there's a lot to prepare for. What was kind of the, your writing schedule like and how did you kind of approach the book, ST? Well, we each had um, sections that we were uh, gifted to write. So um, with that um, epic data bank, is that fair, Clayton? <laughs> that we yeah. were also gifted. Um, we would, I don't know about you, I would comb through it um, knowing, so I knew what my sections were. I knew kind of what the topics would be within each section. And then I would comb through all of the materials, one book or magazine or whatever it was at a time and plug in any facts wherever they might fall on a Word document. Like I had headers of this section, that one. I'd plug in any facts wherever they would go with the reference so I could circle back if I needed to find it later. And then I would end up with these um, big compendiums of facts for each section that I had to write in far too few words to include all the amazing facts that I had just learned. Um, So then I would just highlight the ones that I thought were the best. I would have backups. Um, I would actually write, I think I actually wrote my sections in two or three options and then I submitted them. Um, and, uh, we would kind of parse down from there. You know what? I loved this and this and this one, but this one's better down here. So let's insert it up here. And then we were kind of able to take all of that amazing information and hopefully pull out some of the best of it. Obviously there's so much more that's also the best, but, um, that was the only way I could really parse it all down into manageable bites. Cause it's, it's a lot. I mean, there are just so many great stories about this film. There, there's, See, yes, and I think yes. that's a huge part too, isn't it? Like you, you, when you write something down, I'm sure you agree too, Clayton, you find, you know what? I really like, I wrote this here, but I actually think it works better way up here. Like that, that's such an important part of this whole craft. Yeah. And, and first of all, ST is like a real professional, like <laughs> author. author. So she's like way more organized about this than I was. No. Um, <laughs> what, was cool, what was cool too, is that, that, you know, we had, I have to get, credit to um, our, our amazing editors and, and photo editors and all of those folks who kind of had when I, at least when, by, when I joined and again, got my sections, a lot of the sections were, were sort of plotted out a little bit um, and they had picked some images and kind of uh, the, the topic areas. And so we kind of tried to write to those and uh, yeah, it, it, at the end of the day, you kind of end up with more than, than you're going to use. And there were some things that, um, that I got cut out that I, the little fun factoids here and there that just, we didn't have room for. Um, so that was kind of how, that was kind of how it worked over, over the process of uh, a couple of months, I think was on this, maybe a little bit longer, but um, yeah, it's, it's, it's totally fun. I mean, the whole process starts for me anyway, with watching the movie about 15 times in a row. So it's like, Oh, right. that's, that's, I'm not going to complain about that. Um, but yeah, it, Mrs. Sandel, I'm sorry. I'm watching Return of the Jedi again. It's for work. It's for work. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> it's plus on every television in the house. Constantly. When I get yeah. to work on anything animated, I'm always like, I have to watch these cartoons. These cartoons are, it's my job. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just the way that it is. Uh, through through this creation, because I I very much believe when you when you present or teach something or you write about something, that's one of the best ways to learn. So you both will have such a much more of an immense respect and appreciation for Return of the Jedi because of this incredible visual uh, this visual archive. But it is an archive, right? So 
it's it's you're not just telling the story of Return of the Jedi. That's already been done. George uh, did that, right? Uh, Lawrence Kasdan did that. But uh, there are certain behind the scenes things you you mention st like the fun stuff with the the quote Ewok Wrangler yeah. end quote. Uh, but what are some other fun little tidbits uh, that just kind of spring to mind that you really enjoyed learning about through this book? I think Kelly told us one the other day. It was that the emperor's throne was powered by his tippy tappy toes is what she referred to it. Not a of motor. She did. <laughs> but it spun via his tippy tappy toes because Kelly is alliteration and humor. Yes. As Clayton has demonstrated, the emperor personally moved his throne. Those of you watching on closed circuit can see Clayton spinning around in his chair. <laughs> yes, apparently, yeah, the motor was too loud, I guess, and so he had to do it. He had to do it. Uh, he had to improv. No, no kidding. I, I did not. I did well. I, I apparently, I missed that part. What, what are some things that you noticed, Clayton? Are that you? Uh, gosh, you know. Um, or even if you already knew, it, it's just still fun to kind of shed light on it. Oh man, there's just there's so much there's so much cool stuff. You know what? One thing that that stands out to me is just the the characters that. You know, we're like, like background characters, characters that maybe like at the Sarlacc, all of the uh, all the guys on the skiff, all the creatures and aliens on the skiff. You know, this, they were all like just background creatures. And now it's what's cool is that they, they show up and they all have names and species and planets and backstories. Well, and you that, have three point seven fives up there. I bet some of them are those guys, too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um and also, the other thing I really love was the the Mon Mothma connection because yes, that was cool. You know that that whole epic scene. Um, you know that that's that monologue that she gives feels like it's longer than it is. How long do you think it is? Uh, twenty five seconds. No, a little longer. Yeah, it's like 37, 38 seconds. Huh. But it's to so me, cool it always has felt like a like a two three minute call to arms and right right fly. a and soliloquy it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, if you will <laughs> and it's but it's so short but it made such an impression that mm -hmm. you know george brought the character back all the cut from from the prequels appearances in in animated series of course rogue one uh andor central character in andor i mean just to think that 38 seconds led to this sort of lifetime of, of legacy appearances, I think is kind of a neat, uh, a neat testament to what the, what the film was able to pull off. Did in the research, does it give any kind of a light on many Bothans died to bring us this information? I didn't, <laughs> I didn't learn anything about that. I actually, at one point thought that was what one of the spinoff films was going to be. I mm -hmm. thought that was the story of Rogue One, but I was not correct. So who knows? Yeah. Maybe some. Maybe someday we'll find out. Let, let's talk about uh, the specific layouts of Return of the Jedi archives. I mean, again, mm -hmm. I really wasn't just saying that because you two are lovely people. This is an amazing book. Like I, I was showing it to my son, uh, and he was just flipping through the pages because there's just there's like these pullouts and foldouts, but it's 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 so incredibly detailed. It, it's really like it's almost like if you could go into a museum of return of the Jedi, you would, you would go inside this book because there are yeah. so many mesmerizing images that I, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff. I, there's plenty of things that I've never seen before that just took my breath away. So how many times have you heard Warwick Davis tell the story about the letter he sent to George Lucas asking for toys? If anyone at home doesn't know, often at celebrations or I assume other places, um, you'll get to hear Warwick tell the story about how when he was little, he asked George, he wrote George a letter after he filmed the movie and said, I don't know if you remember me. I was in your movie. May I please have some toys? Thank you very much, Warwick. And we have a copy. I don't like, I don't know how they got this. I don't know how it was kept, but there's a copy of the letter that he wrote. And I think it's my favorite. I think it's my favorite thing in the book is this just incredibly neat penmanship and this adorable, may I please, and just the, the manners on the young man yeah. just, and it's I, not I a picture it. of the letter it's actually the a paper of the letter oh, like no, the same a, size it, it comes yes. out like it it's this is like i'm not just exaggerating it's it's really oh. like a museum archive copy of the letter yeah yeah 
It's really cleverly done. We kind of had a, a, a little bit of an idea that uh, that they were going to do some stuff like that, but I I had no idea till I till I opened the book that it was going to be that extensive or that cool. The other one, the other one that I really like is the uh, the Polaroid, the continuity uh -huh. Polaroid of the uh, the Rebel soldiers uh, on Endor, uh, where they took all these Polaroids to kind of make sure they knew uh, how the costumes all went together, and they they. There's five or six of those Polaroids uh, printed up and packed in the book. They're like they're like super cool. Is one of them Rex? Did we figure that out, or do we not know? Oh. I was just going to ask. Curious, but Question, yeah. I feel like Dave and Dave and Pablo talked about something like that, uh, just kind of playfully, and it just kind of took on a life of its own. But is, I don't yeah. think it's ever been actually confirmed. Well, I want to find out which one of them's Omega now, because, like, who knows? She could be in here, right? Oh, boy. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, that was a spoiler, but I really love the Bad Batch. <laughs> I do, too. The Bad Batch is outstanding. Uh, what What are some uh, What are some sections, um, Clayton, that you wrote that you're particularly proud of, and, and we're just happy to see in, in person. Oh, you know anything that anything that had to do with the models, because I remember when this film went uh, out of the theaters, and uh, we all kind of thought Star Wars was done forever and ever. Um, I immediately jumped into all the behind the scenes books and uh, magazines that that would come out. There was a magazine called Cinefix that I just I oh, subscribed. Yeah. It had all of the all of that stuff and uh, I just fell in love with the model making the model making uh, crew um, the the ships the environments all of that stuff and so it was fun to write about uh, the Death Star 2 model and I had already written this section but last year when um, a place called 3210 Studios shut down this was the original, um, uh, well, second location technically uh, for ILM that was that was in uh, San Rafael. ILM moved out in 2005, 2006, and uh, 3210 uh, was the company that eventually uh, took over the facility. But within this facility, in drawers around uh, up in the old model shop, they still had pieces of the etched brass that they used to make the Death Star 2 model. And that's what it looks like. That's exactly it right there. Wow. Um, and so... Still not framed, it, my friend? Yeah, I, I need to get it framed. I, I need to put it with that picture of George pointing at the model. Um, but it, it was really, really neat to just dive, for me, to dive into um, uh, talking about how a lot of these models were created and who did them and, and all that. Um, that for me was the most fun. I just, I just love that stuff. And that goes back to your, your deep love and admiration for Walt Disney himself and uh, mm -hmm. the models and, and all of the thing. Cause I remember one of the first times you and I went to Disneyland together and you were pointing out these things in the train uh, <laughs> and the models. And I remember, and I just remember seeing like your eyes dancing, like, he loves this stuff. So that's so cool that that would be what you would pick. And that doesn't surprise Yeah, it was cool. It was a lot of fun. It, it was, it was really neat to, to dive into that stuff. St, what about you? What are some of the, some of the sections that you're particularly proud of or that you really enjoyed working on? Um, I really liked learning about all of the models and how they were made. Um, there was one story I remember about. Um, essentially, they had figured out when they were doing the indoor models that there were some foliage items that would sustain the course of a day's shooting better than others. And there was a bunch that was supposed to come and it didn't. And so an entrepreneurial um, ILMer happened to find, I think it was Juniper, um, or I'm pretty sure it was Juniper. He, he found the exact foliage he needed at a nearby office. And so he snuck out at like two in the morning to go and prune it. And the local police discovered this unauthorized pruning and uh, he explained it was for a movie. And I can't remember if he said it was for a Star Wars movie or not, but um, he basically Jedi mind tricked these policemen into letting him escape with the absconded foliage. And they were able to complete the model in time to do the shoot the next day and everything worked out fine. But um, it's that artistry and then that deviousness and then the, okay, we got it. Like, glue it together and and just you know make it work with what we have that um is so just 
um, indicative of those early years that is so magical for me. And to see more of those stories was really fun. What did Rose Dignan say in uh, Light and Magic? We are the Rebel Alliance. Yes, I <laughs> loved that series. That was fantastic. Uh, well, you, you mentioned like magical things. Uh, for me, it's when we look at uh, some of the things in the archive that show the marketing of this film oh, or, oh, sure. or the, the action figures, you know, the Burger King glasses, the, all of those things. Because as, as you both know, and, and listeners of, of the show know, the marketing and the merchandising of Star Wars has been such part and parcel of the experience for so many of us. Mm -hmm. But I really, it's not a question so much as I, that was one of my favorite parts of Return of the Jedi, Ar a visual archive, because it just, it just takes you back to those amazing things to help you kind of bring that movie home for you. Like literally, because you have the merchandise. Yeah, yeah, even like the cartridges, like the video game cartridge labels, mm -hmm. you know, or like you said, the glasses. But as a fan to get to extend your experience in your home or through the, like with the cookbooks, now we can cook what the Life Day celebration feasts would be. I mean, I know we couldn't back in the day, but all these little pieces that let you extend and grow your Star Wars experience, they're just fun to, they're just fun to have. I think I have my, I have an Ahsoka ring on right now because every time oh, I see cool. it, I'm like, oh, that was fun. <laughs> Well, well, speaking of fun, it was fun. Now, ST, I didn't see yours. Um, uh, but Clayton, I, when you got your copy or copies, there were a few copies of the book sent your way. I always like when you get a book out and you and your son take a picture together. Mason and I do the same thing. Uh, is There's just something so special. Isn't it? And, and I still go to Barnes Noble and try to find my book on the bookshelves because it's just kind of a fun feeling, isn't it? It's amazing. And I... I... Uh, haven't been to a bookstore to look to see if this one is on the shelves or not. I'm sure it is. Hopefully it is. But, uh, but yeah, it's, there's nothing like uh, walking in and opening it up and seeing your name on the page, especially with somebody like ST Benday and Kelly. Nye, I was so excited to have my name with yours and Kelly. They're both, I, you know, they're, they're, they're both like, just these amazing, highly respected names in fandom. And so to be like a part of that, this is only my second book project. So to be on the page with those two and the insight team uh, is, is like, it's, you know, it's one of those just pinch me moments. It's a huge plus. It's a huge blessing. I think one of the high points of, of all of the writing for me was going into Disneyland and seeing some of the kids' books I'd done back when they would carry them in Star Trader. And I don't think they, I don't know if they have books in there anymore, um, but they did for a long time. And you would just, you, you remember wishing for the opportunity to get to write for this franchise and wishing on the star and, and then to see it in the place that it's responsible for that phrase. It's just really neat. So we're, I mean, we don't, ever take it for granted. We're really grateful to get to do this. Yeah. And the force is clearly strong with the both of you. And I'm very grateful to not only um, get to experience this book, but to talk with the both of you. Star Wars Return of the Jedi, a visual archive. It is available now. Uh, wherever books are sold, it is, is really this rich bounty of just so much that you love about Return of the Jedi. And not only will it reinforce what you already know and believe about this story, but it's going to add so much detail. It really is like, a, a, just like I said, it's like walking into a museum of Return of the Jedi and, because it's just, it's so wonderful. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is... <laughs> well, I want to thank you both for coming on Coffee with Kenobi. ST... Uh, it was fabulous to get to meet you finally and, and to have you on the show. You're certainly welcome back anytime. Where can people find all of your great works and reach out and say hello? Oh, uh, my website is stbende, S-T-B-E-N-D-E.com. It's got everything on there, and um, it's just a treat to meet you. Our, our friend Ian Desher had always said the loveliest things about you, so I'm very happy that, that we've had our official meeting now. Well, thank you. And Ian is, I love Ian. He's, he is, I know, he's, he is, he is, he is, he's, he's, absolutely, absolutely. And Clayton, always love talking to you, my friend. Um, where can people reach out? I know you've got a lot of great stuff going on with, with Scripps News. Uh, you've got your yeah. books. Uh, you make some podcast appearances and you're a, you're a must follow on social media as well. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, Scripps News. Uh, please tune in whenever you can. Um, 
And then uh, I, I try to collect all of my Star Wars stories on my uh, my personal webpage, which is ClaytonSendel.com. Uh, but I am still, uh, I cannot quit uh, Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it these days. So you can find me there at Clayton underscore Sandell and also on Instagram, which is just at Clayton Sandell. Um, wherever you get your social media. And Clayton's Instagram stories are always really fun. So uh, <laughs> be sure to check him out over there. He really keeps it engaging and, you know, just entertaining. I would describe it as antics. There's a lot of Clayton antics, antics on Instagram. Yeah, mm. for sure. I wouldn't have it any other way. No way. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars-related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for.